Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how I recreated Muna's Anything But Me. This synth pop record has been making insane waves and it has such a fun, like Tears for Fears, almost classic triplet style synth thing going on. And today I'm gonna to show you how I recreated it in Ableton from scratch. We're gonna go over how to process an 80s pluck synth bass, messing around with some 80s reverb techniques, how to use distorted guitars as sort of a chunky backup layer for a synth and a lot more. But before we jump into all that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I produce music under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to produce their own pop music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you enjoy this video and you feel like we might work well together, check out the link in my description. All right, now let's jump into it. So as you can see, everything is frozen right now in Ableton is because there is a lot of processing on this track, so much so that it was kind of struggling with my computer, which is a pretty beefy computer. If you're going to try to recreate this one at home and you don't have like the best computer, I would address it in chunks, like maybe render out MIDI as audio. But anyway, let's just jump into it. So the first thing that we're going to jump into, which is the most recognizable part of the song, is this sort of pluck bass. I'll just unfreeze stuff as I go. So I got this sound using this grid mode mod in Anna 2, but I actually turned off the arpeggiator that it had on it and like all the effects and stuff like that because it has like some weird effects stuff going on. And I just used the stock Ableton arpeggiator. I actually use this a lot and it's really useful when you're doing sort of like single note baseline stuff like this. So you literally just hold down the note that you want it to play, set it to the subdivision you want. Since we're in triplets, it's one twelfth, and then you adjust the gate to whatever you feel like. This bass was the thing that I tweaked the most all the way up to yesterday when I was doing the mixing I was still tweaking it and it was one of the last things that I finished so yeah it's definitely worth spending the time to get it right it's not a purely 80s synth honestly I would say that it's more of like a modern EDM pluck than like a vintage Juno or something like that but an overview of how I got this sound is I took that patch in Anna 2 and I spread it across three octaves so we have this very low sub octave this sort of mid-range beefy octave and then this octave up and I just used EQs and filters to sort of narrow in on the frequencies that I wanted to use for each of those. I like approaching synth basses this way because adding an octave up can really make a sub bass stand out in a mix and adding an octave below can really make a part sound beefier. And this was just one of those sounds where I felt like I needed both of those. And as you can see, I blended in different versions of all of them. So this higher layer here isn't really there that much, but you feel it when you take it out. So here's all of them together. Here's just the low end. Here's the mid-range one, and here's the high one. So blending those all together and putting them in a group really gave me that sound that I was looking for. And I feel like filtering out EQs with stuff like this, it's a great way to make sure you're not adding excessive low end or high end in places where you don't need it. Like I don't need any high end really in this upper layer here. I really only want that like higher octave so I can filter out this sub low end and not really have it do that much. And it makes the whole mix cleaner. And on these two upper layers, I actually threw on the Ableton amp plugin, which this is something that I used to do as a sound design trick often. And when I listened to the song on top, title uncompressed I could have sworn that this is how they got that sound like when I have these two layers and I take off the guitar amps versus when I put them on it just gives it this sort of weird tubey feel. It spreads it out a bit, almost has a bit of a lo-fi effect on it. But yeah, it's only blended in like 30%. Refroze them so my computer doesn't freak out. So on the bus, we just have a basic shaping EQ, cutting a tiny bit of the high end off, just high passing it around 30 because it was a little bit too much in the low end, using some Moti T on the bass enhancer preset around 20%, tweaked it a little bit, using some Waves Bass Rider to sort of level out the overall feel of the bass. Since we have these like descending bass lines on a bass, since the frequencies move so slowly in comparison to other elements, you can get this weird thing where specific notes are just more resonant than others based off of the key of your mix and they'll just seem louder. So this just kind of tames that a little bit. A couple of instances of our bass just to accentuate a couple of these higher frequencies that I wanted to bring out a little bit more. They're not really low frequencies they're more so the the transition point between the upper lows and sort of the lower mids this guy is super fun for anyone who doesn't know i just installed the plugin alliance mega bundle and it is one of my favorite plugin bundles that i've gotten in a while so i highly recommend it and one of my favorite ones that i've gotten from that pack is this guy this is the sbl twin tube processor and it's just a really usable harmonic exciter plugin you just have this saturation knob here and it's really easy to add different upper harmonics using this knob and you can control 
control what frequency range they're being added to and you can a b stuff anyway it's super good and then i did feel like this bass it felt like a more of a modern plug but i did feel like it had more of a vintage juno chorus on it now the thing to keep in mind is if you're going to put chorus on a bass you need to do something with that low end so whenever i'm using a chorus on something like a bass i am always making the low end mono it can really make stuff flubby if you're leaving like the low end like the sub low end in a stereo field it doesn't really translate that well added some one knob pumper just because i wanted to add a little bit more of a side chain than what was already being added on the end here i'm side chaining the kick using a bit of soothe to cut out the fundamental of the kick drum so all together and when i take all this off on it's like a night and day difference. Okay, next are the drums. So with this song, it's a very Tears for Fears, almost like triple it beat. You can really hear it digging into the hi-hat on those off beats here in the chorus. But for the most part, I would say from the writing of these drums, they're pretty straightforward. Very basic. Little bit of a triple it fluff with the kick. You can hear what I mean with that hi-hat. That's a very Tears for Fears drum beat, and I, I love Tears for Fears, so obviously I love this beat. All right, so let's go through everything individually. We start out with the snare, which is this 505 snare going into a little Moti T just to sort of level it out. I've been using Moti T as more of a leveler recently instead of a really heavy exciter. And then just because I wanted that 80s feel, I felt like throwing it into this Acme Octacomp, which is a really nice vintage compressor, but gives it a little bit of a flavor. And then this snare is being blended in with this other guy which is more of like a white noise 80 snare, really low underneath it. Again, Moti T. And then the two of these are being blended together on this bus. And then processing wise, using some max bass to bring up that subby low end. Just makes it jump out of the speakers a little bit more. Did some EQ because I didn't want as much low end here. And then there was this one annoying ringing frequency that I wanted to get rid of. Again, this SPL twin tube. And then this guy, which I would say is the main secret to this drum sound, this non-linear reverb. And for anyone who doesn't know, non-linear reverb was something that was really popular in the 80s, around the time where they started creating digital reverb racks instead of using physical reverb devices like spring reverbs or plate reverbs or halls. So a non-linear reverb is something that can only exist in the digital world where instead of a large hit up front that slowly dies down, a non-linear reverb will have a hit and then the the volume of that will go up. Like if you listen to it. Yeah. And so when you blend it in, it just gives you that sort of like, I almost want to say Prince style drum reverb, which I absolutely love. And then for the kick drum, just a super basic sample. Nothing super fancy about the kick. My buddy Johnny also turned me on to this Brainworks EQ in the Plugin Alliance bundle, and it has become like my main EQ for stuff because it's very usable on the mixing side. Some Moti T, SBL Twin Tube. This guy is interesting. I might play with it a little bit more. This Brainworks BX Boom. Essentially, it's where you pick different frequency ranges that are kind of essential to a kick drum standing out in a mix, and you can either add it or subtract it. I mean, on some level, it's just basically an EQ, but yeah, it was just a quick thing to add. And then our bass again, just because this kick didn't have as much of that low end punch as I wanted. And then these hi hats are really processed. I'm just using the modern massive drums on the pop punkers dream preset. Sometimes if hi hats are a little bit too harsh, I'll use a de-esser on them because it can be good for sort of dynamically pulling down the hissiness instead of adding a full multiband compressor. Again, broken record, Moti T. And then I would say a main part of the degradation is done through RC20 and then blending it in with the magnitude. So with it on, with it off, with it on. Like it degrades the high end, which I, I'm a broken record now. I do that all the time. But legitimately with this song, I didn't feel like the hi hats were super bright. Also, some of these drums are going to three different reverb sends. One, which is this sort of like long haul just to give things a bit of air. That one I'm almost using as a plate. Using another ROM on that initial patch more as like an ambient sound design reverb. And then I'm using Verb Suite for that sort of like gated 80s drum sound, which a lot of the individual drums are being sent to, which we will hear next on the toms.
Like you can hear that like gated 80s tom sound, which is really fun. I tried looking through my sample libraries to find some roto toms. I couldn't really find any, so I kind of like threw some together with this Thomas Pridgen set from Mixwave. If there's anything I'd like to change about this beat, it would probably be these guys, because I would like to actually add some real roto toms. But these guys got the job done. So just doing some basic EQ. I wanted sort of that sample -y feel for the tom, so I added a gate so you can see. It's like clamping down on them after that initial transient. There's no ringing out of the toms. And then I just decimated them with RC20 because I did not want them to have that like clean high end that they normally have. Like I wanted them to have like that sort of honky mid range. Also, I believe I tuned these toms up in the plugin quite a bit. Like I believe these are the two floor toms. So they're normally really low compared to this. And yeah, so modern and massive for crashes. You know, now that I think about it, this beat is probably slowing down my computer because I have so many different drum kits doing single pieces. But honestly, like when you mix drum samples and libraries like this together, you do kind of get a drum sound that you can't really get anywhere else. But anyway, on to the guitars. So first we have this guy, which is just me playing octaves on like the A and the G string and just sliding it up and down, which is a fun little like offbeat turnaround thing that just makes the beat exciting. Finally got guitar rig working again, which makes me really happy. Just using this Foo Monkey Ultra preset, which is essentially a Foo Fighters preset using this ultrasonic, which is kind of like a dumble. High passing it a lot, using some L1 to tame the peaks. And for the first time in a while, I'm actually playing around with using some saturation on a guitar that's already pretty distorted. And it just makes it like pop out of the mix. Like that was with it on, now with it off. It just, it just comes a little bit more alive. And then after we have that, we have this guy, which is the sort of main, I would say counterpoint, like triplet melody. And that was just a strat going through this print in the rain preset, high passing it again, using a limiter again to tame the peaks and some more distortion, really using that ROM reverb on this guy, because this is more of like a sound design thing than an actual like how to use a reverb. If you're a mixing engineer and you're using a reverb this much, there's something wrong. But for the production side, I kind of let myself go loose with it. And then if I need to tame it in the mixing phase, I'll do that later. Guys, seriously, just let yourselves have fun. Turn up the reverb all you want. Also, I should mention pretty much everything other than the drums is being compressed with a like a sidechain compressor so everything's kind of ducking out of the way of the kick because i do feel like the kick drum is the real focus point of the song and then we have these guys which i call like my synth enhancement layer and they're just double tracked electrics also using my strat i won't unfreeze them now but i can tell you it's the other foo fighters patch inside of guitar rig which is the gratifier which is like a mesa and these guys are basically just here to double up what that plucked synth bass is doing when the chorus hits it just makes everything feel a little bit more energetic but as you can see they're not super heavy in the mix after this we have a couple of synthesizers so the first one we have is this lead line this like little twinkly thing that just wakes you up. I would say it's probably the most 80s thing in this track. So it's a blend of a couple of sounds, which is this dire DX sound. And then to add a little bit of high end excitement around it, we have this glass bell. And then to keep them from sounding a little bit too modern and clean, I ran them into pre-1973 from Arturia. Really cut the highs, high pass them a lot to get rid of the low end, some surgical stuff, some broadband EQ stuff, and really drove them into the preamp section. This is one of my favorite ways to sort of like add saturation to something in an analog way without using something like an SPL saturator. You get this sort of like analog board style distortion. Underneath that, we have some arcade using this waitlist preset. And just in case you want want to know which exact sounds I'm using. Really ambient, really fills out a lot of that space in the track. Again, MoTT. Then I'm using an auto filter. And as you can see in that first section of the song, it's down here and then it sort of swoops up like this. One thing I really like about Ableton is it's really easy to make curves like that because normally they're like straight like this. And so what you can do is you can just hold alt and it will turn it into like a little bit more of like a sloped curve, like a Bezier type thing. And you can do it over or under or whatever. That's a really useful trick if you're doing automation stuff. Our sound effects. So the first one we have here is clap impact, but is actually not being used in the way that I normally use it. So it's this like white noise layer that's being played every time we get to the fourth snare or the eighth. Basically the last snare hit of the bar has this sort of like white noise crash thing behind it and just adds this really nice tail like slash repetition thing before the progression goes back into itself. For my actual crashes, I'm using some of these guys 
which I'm using some erosion frequency, sort of like a white noise texture that it adds on top of the sound, which can be great if it's like the right sound, but you want it to have a little bit of a different characteristic in the high end. And we have this guy from the Leno pack, which is more of like an actual crash symbol. And then a Lex Luger symbol for that white noise hit. And then we have some risers, which all together. So we have a vocal one shot and then a couple of like sweeps up at the end, which I've been doing a lot more. It makes the transition point of a beat or like a chorus just hit a little bit harder. And that is everything in the song. I didn't really do like a full mastering chain on this one, but I did get this Katelikov mastering compressor, which is actually free, by the way. And it's a super useful mastering compressor because you actually have separate releases for your peak and your RMS. And anyone who does mastering stuff, you know, that's super handy. I got this from a mastering class that I'm currently Currently watching right now, made by my buddy Nicholas Roberto Di Lorenzo from Panorama Mixing and Mastering. The dude is legitimately awesome. And his mastering course is probably one of the most comprehensive guides I've seen so far. And this is somebody who's taken a lot of courses online. So if any of you are looking into mastering something for yourself, I would highly recommend checking out his stuff at Panorama Mixing and Mastering. Also with the Plugin Alliance stuff, there's a lot of really fun new mastering plugins that I have never been able to play with, like this Better Maker EQ, but basically some very very, very light cuts in like the 300 hertz range, a little bit of boost in the 600, high passing it, not that much, just to control the flubbiness of the low end. If I was doing this mix for an actual client, I would probably spend a lot more time mixing the kick and the bass because that low end flubbiness would definitely be an issue if I was like putting this to print. And then a linear phase multiband, but I'm not using it the way that I've normally used it in the past. This is just more like mid range control, just as a way to sort of tame this area here dynamically, but it actually doesn't really affect the low end or the high end at all. Another thing I learned from Nicholas. And then I just kind of wanted to get it done. So I just threw it into a limiter. But yeah, that's everything in the track. So let's listen to what it sounds like. So yeah, hopefully you learned something from this video. Again, if you enjoy this stuff, I do one of these every Friday. If you want to be notified when they come out, hit the subscribe and the bell icon and all that stuff below. Also, if you have any other sort of like synth pop or guitar based pop stuff that you would like to see me cover, please put it down in the comments. I genuinely do look at them for inspiration for videos. But yeah, if you want to subscribe, you can click over there or you can click over here, which is what the algorithm thinks you should be watching. But yeah, I will see you guys in the next video.